Hello, I'm the Eggman, and I have no idea what I just watched. <laughs> and I am the Walrus, and don't worry, we'll help you. A.K.A. Lux and... Ember. <laughs> and this is our thoughts on... The Beatles' self-done film, Magical Mystery Tour. Um, hmm. I was going into this knowing that'd be a little crazy. The beginning started out kind of normal with the voiceover talking about a couple who's arguing not, all the not time. Not a couple. It's his aunt. It's his aunt? Yes. Huh. I completely picked that up wrong. How did you pick that up wrong? Mr. Blood Vessel was outright flirting with her and said he was in love with her. Yeah, but I thought they were, because the way they phrased it, I thought they were a couple and I thought by the end of this, they'd be broken up and be better off without each other. And that's why I thought it was okay for Mr. Blood Vessel to be hitting on her because... Okay, apparently Lex and I were watching totally different films. And apparently you're very good at understanding this crazy, crazy movie that it is because wizards. Well, it concerned me a great deal the very first time I watched Magical Mystery Tour with my mom because before watching it, she told me that she didn't know how anyone could understand it without being on a drug trip. Well, we paused the film to take a break. You know, VHS, you can do that. And I go, Mom, I'm a little concerned because the story itself makes perfect sense. Because, what is it, four or five wizards? Yes, four or five magicians. Ah, because you're never quite sure of that number. Well, the thing is, you see five people in the wizard's residence, but there's only four beetles. So is it four magicians, or is it five? Ah, the cinematography in this film is interesting, and the way they do certain shots, just, hmm, it's actually shot rather well. I wonder who they got, or did the beetles do? the camera work because apparently it's a self-done film by then because john had confidence in his friends that they could do something creative like this outside of their music at least that's what i remember it saying in a special edition set that we happen to have <laughs> because surprisingly the special edition set was actually cheaper than buying the movie by itself crazy it's kind of like the fact that we don't have a copy of help yet because the dvd is more expensive than the blu-ray yes we still don't have a blu-ray player yeah it's not a big deal I mean, everything is going streaming or digital anyways. I just wish movie companies would get over the hurdle of digital rights management. It's been proven not to work again and again and again. Mm -hmm. The only reason it's kind of working now is because they finally agreed on a weird standard that allows all the movie services to work together through a new app that came out recently called Movies Anywhere. And what you do is you purchase something through one of those services and Movies Anywhere automatically transfers that right to any of the other services. So you can get that movie on all the services at once, basically, without having to buy it every single time. Well, that's something at least. But yes, the film was largely self-produced. They got friends. They got some talented people in camera crew. They had a very rough outline. There was almost no script. They would discuss a scene and how they wanted it to go. And then they would film it pretty much immediately afterwards. So it was mostly ad-libbed. Hmm. So did they write the songs for the movie or did they just take songs they had already that they were planning on releasing in an album and put it in the movie? A uh, very few of the songs were new material, so it was mostly reuse. Ah, so how many new tracks did they have? They had six new tracks and it was very interesting because what kept those six tracks from hitting number one on a double EP was their own album, Hello Goodbye. So they released these at the same time, or this came out at the same time? There was time. some overlap with the albums, and there was a lot of people trying to get the U.S. release in Britain, because in the U.S. we got the six new tracks combined with some of the Beatles' newest at that time singles. Ah. The waters get a little muddy between the U.S. releases and the U.K. releases, because we don't always have the same exact albums, some of the cuts are different, the organization. Ah, I kind of like how some people prefer the mono versions of the songs compared to the new stereo remixes. Mm-hmm. Hmm. What's really interesting is, to me, the beginning of the movie makes the most sense. It's somewhere around the middle where things start to get a little wacky, and some of the Cuts they do is kind of neat, like the classic trick of an establishing shot tricking you into thinking something else, like how they end up going into a small tent and it's huge on the inside because of how they cut things. 
they used a lot of neat camera tricks and they used a lot of things that became standard in later actual pop music videos. Mm. Like jump shots and the superimposed images. Though I believe they actually did that by running the film through twice through the camera. So yes, the beginning made the most sense because that was the basic concept, going on a mystery tour. Which is actually a thing. It's a bus tour where the final destination is not known by the people who purchased the tickets. Nowadays that would be scary dangerous. Though another reason the beginning made the most sense to me is I thought they were setting up that these two people were going to go on this tour and then make up or break up or, you know, whatever by the end of it. But they never go back to those two after that first section. They just follow everyone on the bus after that. They do focus on them a little bit because you have the whole dream sequence, you know, where she's dreaming about food. You have the whole thing between her and Mr. Blood Vessel where after he declares his love for her and faints, which comes before the dream sequence I just mentioned, they do a whole scene of them doing all these romantic couple things. Yeah, but I mean like focusing on them, not just a singular and breaking them apart because they come on, they set it up, they focus on them at the beginning and then they start splitting things off and it's hopping around other people like the other Beatles who are also on the bus. And then we have the music videos and we're cutting with everything and you're like, okay, the music videos are the clearest part of this? Even that one that is really wacky that we referenced in the beginning of this episode? And I'm like, how does this not make sense? It's a mystery tour and the people who run it do so knowing that weird, mystical, magical things are going to happen. And the magicians, four or five of them, we're never sure, are specifically watching out for the bus. So we know they're the ones doing this. The only thing we don't know is if they're actually colluding with each other or if the bus takes this route just knowing that weird stuff will happen or if they actually have a deal with the magicians. And going back to the music, most of these songs I don't actually remember hearing except for like a couple. Like, I didn't know about Blue Jay Way. So that was the first time I heard that song. It was the first time I heard a lot of the songs except for um, I Am The Walrus. Well, at the very least, you've played that on Beatles Rock Band with me. I didn't even know the last song, which I didn't realize was the last song because I'm like, well, that's a nonsensical way to end this movie. There's no resolution, really. <laughs> well, there wasn't really a conflict to begin with. Yeah, but you can at least like end out of the trip, go back to normal. No, you end right with the trip. The trip's still going by the end of this thing and it doesn't stop. Well, that's the whole thing. A magical mystery tour is coming to take you away. Who says you get to come back? Spirited away? Okay. <laughs> yeah, except for the fact that they say that uh, Mr. Blood Vessel has been on every single one of the tours. Ah. Though, if he's been on every single one of the tours, does he have the same immunity that the driver and the male and female tour guides have? Interesting. I like this movie overall, but it's just, after the end of it, I was like sitting there going, yeah, mm, okay. <laughs> so because that ending just dropped me, I'm like, huh. Yeah, and that was one of the more scripted moments because they actually built a set for it because they knew they wanted to make your mother should know a big production number and they needed a set for it. Mm-hmm. All the music numbers are really well done. Well, they're the Beatles. They kind of had to be. I'm talking about the cinematography for those shots, the way they're set up, the way they're done. Those are all really solid. Well, the Beatles did a lot of their own home movies. They had friends who did amazing home movies. And they put together a pretty skilled cinematography crew for what we're looking at as a TV broadcast film instead of a... I don't know what you'd say in Britain, but a Hollywood-level big-budget film. Though so that reminds me of some nice stuff from A Hard Day's Night that was on the DVD, where, I think it was on the DVD, some of the special features where the Beatles were just playing around with a recording device and people were filming them. Mm -hmm. Or they were filming themselves, I can't remember. I just remember a recording device being involved and they were having fun with the audio and stuff. And just playing around, which is an aspect of the Beatles that didn't always necessarily get to be seen. The media had them so locked in as the Fab Four, the Mop Top, you know, these clean-cut kids, and had trouble dealing with the fact that, no, they kind of grew up a little bit. They have individual interests and personalities. You can't just go, these four people are copies of each other. It doesn't work that way. 
I never really thought of them as copies of each other. Though for some strange reason, recently I had trouble remembering like, well, I know Ringo, I know Paul and John, but the other guy I was like, I don't recognize him in this movie. <laughs> and I didn't recognize him until like later and I'm like, oh. Yes, that was George. Quick explanation in case it isn't obvious by now. Uh, while Lux enjoys the Beatles, he is not the hardcore devotee that you normally see in Beatles fans. Yeah, I like their music and everything. Just not like, oh, yeah, cool, they're nice. I I've always liked Ringo the most, which I don't know if it's a standard thing. <laughs> I remember Paul being the big thing. Jean and Paul usually because the drummer's in the back. But the thing about Ringo, I was like, I like Ringo. He seems like a fun guy. When I was little, he was the one I could pick out most easily in the posters, so yeah. And that reminds me, we recently saw a really nice photo of them. And I'm like, the guy who took this picture is awesome. The framing and composition of this shot is amazing. <laughs> because it did such a good job of drawing your eyes right to the Beatles. And it did it in such a way that you actually went from one to the other to the other to the other, and you saw all of them in your eyes just went whoop, boom, and you're like, oh, and it was in black and white, and it was stunning. It felt like it was in color. Because it was very crisp and detailed and just drew you right in. Now, of course, that you've praised it so much, you're going to have to see if you can find it and link to it in the know. description below. I didn't pay attention to actually the name of the photo because that'd be the easiest way to find it because it was definitely an earlier shot of them. Yes. So back to the movie itself with what was your favorite parts of this? <laughs> well, Fool on the Hill is one of my favorite songs, so yeah, somewhere in the top 50. The song itself or the music video because it involved Paul? The song itself. The music video is really interesting. You know, the way they focus on the eyes and the way they cut through the shots. Hmm, I can see that. There's one of the things I caught about is how they were focusing on the eyes. Though sometimes to me, the way the eyes were moving kind of went against the way the lyrics were talking about the eyes. So that was kind of disjointed for me. Not disjointed like the rest of this movie, but like, eh, didn't quite feel right in the context of the music video itself inside this movie. <laughs> I'm not quite sure I have a favorite part, but there are some parts that I kind of lean to more than others, like I Am The Walrus. That is such an iconic song for them. In the music video, I've never actually watched all the way through. So actually seeing it, I'm like, Ah, huh. though I'm still confused in the whole, why is it confusing who's the walrus? Why, why, why is this a thing? Because based on what I saw, it was John. So I'm not confused. Why was this a question? Can you explain to me why was this a question? No, it's just such a pop culture thing. It was actually the correct answer to a dialogue in Bill and Ted's Excellent Video Game Adventure. Or NES. I've heard about that game and I saw a strategy guide to it in Nintendo Power, but I didn't know that. Mainly because I never read the strategy guide. Well, there's all sorts of Beatles mystique. They say, I think the walrus was Paul was something that you could hear if you played a song backwards, supposedly. And there's also the classic John must die or something. Or George must die if you played one of the, or is dead or something like that. Like, yeah, you, you play any of those songs backwards, it just sounds like a backwards song. And if you hear anything in it, that's your brain trying to interpret something as actual speech. The more I learn about how the human brain works, the more I go, you lie to me. Constantly. Because <laughs> your brain's just a machine that's going, I think I know what I'm doing. You're not dead yet, right? <laughs> I seem to be doing a good job then. Which is basically what it does. Are you dead yet? Okay, good. I'm doing my job. So, I think we've rambled on long enough about this crazy, awesome, weird, whacked out drug trip of a wonderful, crazy, made-for-TV movie. <laughs> Did I fit enough adjectives in there? <laughs> and adverbs? I, I think so. Lolly, 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 get your adverbs here. I was going to reference that, yes. Also, Weird Al should get together with the people who did Schoolhouse Rock and, like, bring it back with him and other people. Him and Rockapella. Rockapella's actually done some educational stuff. Oh, that's cool. So that would be an awesome mix-up. Where in the world is... Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> oh, we can mention the Gentleman's Club. That was pretty oh, racy. Yeah. <laughs> that's when I looked over at Amber and went, this was shown on TV? 
because I don't know if those sensor bars were there in the actual live broadcast because a girl gets naked. Well, live as in original television broadcast. It wasn't like it was live like the Super Bowl is live. Yeah. But I want to know where the ladies got to go while the guys went to this gentleman's club. Because the ladies and gentlemen were separated, but we only got to see the gentleman scene. Hmm. Yeah, I remember wondering about that as I was watching it, but then forgot about it because I was like, whoa, what? Huh? Also, to let everyone know, as we're doing this recording, I have Beatles songs in my head. That's good, you should. But not the ones from the movie. <laughs> because we talked about the album, I now have Hello Goodbye in my head. <laughs> well, I can understand you not really getting the songs from this film stuck in your head too much since you don't know them very well. And just since Lux couldn't remember, it's Ringo's aunt, Aunt Jessie. Ah. Well, her name is Jessie Robbins, but the book credits her just as Ringo's aunt, but oh. her name is Jessie Robbins. You know, there's just some great lines in here, like, Concerned that you enjoy yourself within the limits of British decency. Um, oh, that's another thing. Watching this movie, I'm like, this was definitely during the 60s. Not a tire or anything, but just the way it was done felt very like, yeah, I remember a lot of movies from this time period feeling this way. It's kind of like you can go back and watch something from the 80s and go, 80s. And then you go for the 90s and I'm like, yeah, that is so 90s. Especially since they just used the word rad, cool, and not a lot. Man, was the word not popular in the 90s. Yes, the ability to say something and immediately take it back. Okay, just summing back through it is actually Aunt Jessie. So they used her real name. Huh. Makes sense. I mean, Ringo, well, I can't say Ringo used his real name because his real name's Richard. Oh, that's a fun fact I actually didn't know. Oh, you didn't know that Ringo Starr's name is Richard Starsky. That's cool. Both of his names work. That's neat. I never knew that his stage name was Ringo Starr that... Yes, because people just have the last name Starr all the time. That can happen. Though he wasn't born in the 60s. Some weird names came out of the 60s. So yeah, it's hard to understand, you know, the individual strange things that happen in the film if you look at them and go, okay, so why did the guy who took the photograph, after he took the photograph, come out with a bear's head? If you think about it like that, it makes no sense. I completely forgot about that detail. Thank you for bringing it back up. Also, that weird race. The insanely weird race where everyone is racing and going over multiple types of media and ganging up together and trying to pass each other. It's like, how does that even count? It starts as a foot race and then bicycles and cars and then you get on the bus. Yeah, I was just thinking, they did some interesting things with that bus. That must have been pretty dangerous because buses like to tip. I also like as they were getting near the end of that chase slash race, they kept speeding up the footage more and more and more and more and more. <laughs> I also noticed they reused a couple of clips there a couple of times because they were making a loop. Yeah, makes sense. It's like, should we share our ideas? No, wait, there's too much. Let's sum up. Yes, yeah, so away in the sky, beyond the clouds, live four or five magicians. By casting wonderful spells, they turn the most ordinary coach trip into a magical mystery tour. If you let yourself go, the magicians will take you away to marvelous places. Oy they. That's actually the entire plot of the movie right there. Thank you. And good night. And this has been our organic freeform discussion of The Beatles Magical Mystery Tour. If you've enjoyed this wild ride on this magical mystery tour known as our podcast, please subscribe, like, share, comment. Please comment. We love comments. And thanks to this fact that this is YouTube, there'll be a magical mystery tour in themselves. <laughs> then, if you've liked my art... If I've actually drawn anything I don't know at this point, please visit me on Tumblr, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, and any other place I can think of on the web because my brain's kind of fried right now. Oh, um, you want to give me money to draw something fantastical for you? There's a link down below for my commissions. Pricing stays the same pretty much. Availability can randomly change, but mostly because of life. Oh, you just want to help me? Dross, whatever I want. Well, there's a Patreon down below and you can give me ideas because sometimes I don't have ideas like after watching this wonderful mystery tour. Oh, uh, you don't want a monthly fee through my Patreon. Well, it is only a dollar for that, by the way. 
But if you don't want the monthly thing, there's coffee, K-O-F-I. There's a link for that down below. It's a one-time payment of $3. Thank you. Thank you for watching. This has been kind of random for us. If you like this, please like, subscribe, share, comment, check out other videos. None of our other videos are about the Beatles at this time, but there's lots of stuff. You like stuff, right? The internet has stuff. It's full of stars and stuff. <laughs> mostly stuff. Mostly. There are some stars though, but mostly stuff. If you like Lux's art, assuming he draws something for this, where's the bus? You can find more of it on Tumblr, Twitter, DeviantArt, Google+, Facebook, a couple Mastodon servers, and wherever else he finds on the internet that they let him post drawings. They let me post stuff here? Wow! Sir, that's the FBI site. Oh, oops. Want to get your own custom image? Surprisingly, Lux still takes commissions. Uh, details can be found by clicking on the link below. Pricing, ridiculously reasonable. Availability, subject to change. With minimal notice. It's this thing called Life, not the breakfast cereal. Oh, channel support? Yeah, yeah, we have that too. Uh, there's Patreon and Coffee. Patreon, as low as a dollar, gets you a monthly sketch, higher tiers, more perks. But hey, you know, if everybody who watched this video gave us a dollar, we would have a lot of dollars. Don't want a recurring charge? Check out Coffee, K O FI. Works in increments of three, one time payment. All you need is PayPal. Thanks again for listening. And thank you to all my current Patreon supporters.